Thomas, Thomas Gugler from the University of Vienna, is it right? Still? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Thomas Gugler has well founded expertise in Islamic studies, in modern South Asian studies, as well as in religious studies. He studied in Munich, did his PhD at the University of Erfurt. He was a research fellow at the ZMO, Centrum Moderne Orient, is it better? <coughs> here in, Be in Berlin between 2006 and 2009. And later, in 2010, he became postdoctoral research fellow, research fellow at the Department of Near Eastern Studies at the University of Vienna. Uh, and currently, he is receiving a Gerda Henkel Foundation scholarship. So, among his regional focus, Pakistan, India, and Germany. And uh, Thomas published a wide range of books and articles on personal piety, the phenomena of super Muslims on jihadi groups and more recently on the missionary or reform movements of the Tablighi Jamiat and Dawati Islami. And his following paper illustrates how the imitatio muhammadi or the sunnization of everyday life routines marks a special way of life, a lifestyle that is linked very much with different forms of expressing non-political inner reform and personal piety. So. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very grateful to be here and share and discuss some ideas with you. About 70% of all Muslims live in Asia, about 50% in South and Southeast Asia. Around one third of the world Muslim population is located in South Asia. Sunni Islam in South Asia subdivides into several schools of thought, the largest being the Barilvis, and the Deobandis. These two rival Islamic reformist movements compete with each other for members, resources, authority, and impact in society. In this paper, I strive to understand how market forces impact on strategies of free traditionalization in the production and marketing of Sunnah systems by applying the metaphor of religious economics. Sunnah systems here mean Islamic image, symbol, and behavior systems that enable religious practice to expand over and thus integrate everyday worlds. These Sunnah systems are associated with the transubstantive power to transform everyday routine into a quasi-religious ritual, making Islam a lifestyle by Sunnahizing clothing style, speech, and behavior, every action becomes ibadah. Freedom of religion has led to the emergence of increasingly deregulated religious markets with new competing actors offering their salvation goods and services in order to increase their market shares. Challenged by and coping with modernity and globalization, World religions have undergone a dramatic transformation during recent decades with consumers' preferences of new religious goods and services shaping the religious change. Once a religious market is open to competition, more exclusivist and demanding groups create new religious products and practices, advertising their new way of life through semantics which heavily rely on cultural codes of individualism, experience, consumerism, and pragmatism. Under the condition of increasing consumer autonomy, religious actors cultivate corporate identity, establish brand names by making the specific qualities of their salvation goods visible in public spaces. In a competitive race for numbers, New Islamic movements compete for impact and recognition, branding Sunnah sy systems and symbols in the semantics of seeker spirituality for the mass marketed culture of com contemporary modernity. New transnational communication and social spheres like the World Wide Web enabled diverse agents of modern religious culture to organize systematic symbol transfer ritual theft, and theological osmosis of ideas. As a result of these processes of transformation of religious traditions 
and the new potentials to overcome traditionally defined boundaries of communitarian milieus, new religious movements for self-improvement and piety mushroomed up, which dramatically reshape the relation between religions and de denominations. Muslims now choose from an increasingly diverse set of Islamic identities. The spiritual culture of the invisible or implicit individualized religion is increasingly provided by the particularist universalisms of the so-called new religiosity. Mixing motives of psychological fashion trends, individual seeking and personal achievement in reform and systematic self-perfection in self-mastery. The new forms of religiosity are communitarian, exclusive in the sense that a clear line divides the saved from the damned, and inclusive in the sense that all aspects of life and each and every aspect of the daily routine comes under the aegis of religion. This is the reason why academics refer to these Muslims often as ideal Muslims, super Muslims, perfect Muslims, or neo-Muslims. And these Muslims consider more cultural Muslims, Friday, Ramadan, or 50-50 Muslims. <coughs> these new forms of Islamic piety are individualistic, very mobile, weakly institutionalized, and anti-intellectual. Besides social support and relief from personal anxiety, members experience the positive benefits of travel opportunities in transnational religious organizations and movements. A constant high level of social control and repressive enforcement of adaption to agreed moral standards of behavior create important structures of trust, which results in tight networks of high solidarity. These networks of increased solidarity are the core for social and career advancement as well as gain and prosperity as they foster division of labor and reduce transaction costs. In a world in which many businessmen do not pay their bills anymore, trust has become the most important currency and we will actually see when we later talk about two concrete organizations, the Tabliri Jamaat and its Sufi or Barilvi rival counter-movement, the dawat e islami that, whole, uh, that both organizations are associated with their own trader networks. And we can see whole trader networks in South Africa, for example, converting from Deobandiat to Barilviat once their business partners in Karachi convert. The Indian subcontinent hosts a comparably high diversity of religious groups and movements and communities with tradition-specific and to some extent high, highly professional networks of scholars. Around 80% of the Muslims in India and Pakistan are Sunnis. The Barilvi and the Deobandi reformist schools of thought have meanwhile developed new tradition-specific faith movements for piety and self-improvement. The poorest reform movement of Deoband is based upon a seminary founded in the North Indian city of Deoband in 1866 and strives to pur purify the custom loan style of South Asian Islam from alleged Hindu influences. Around 1880, a counter reformist movement emanated around Ahmed Riza Khan from Bareilly. This Barilvi school of thought is close to folk Islam and Sufism. Barilvi scholars underline the value of traditional rituals revolving around sands and shrines and highlight the veneration of the Prophet Muhammad, whom they consider to possess specific qualities like Ilm uh, Hazir or Nazir, and these like. The majority of Sunni Muslims in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh are considered to be more connected to the Barilvi school of thought. During the 20th century, Barilviat has undergone several changes in structures of authority following the death of its main figure, Ahmed Riza Khan. 
During the 1980s, a handful of neo barelvi organizations evolved, propagating new forms of traditional religion, striving to establish themselves as the modern Barelviat. The largest and most modern of them is the missionary movement Dawate Islami, the Barelvi version of the Tabliri Jamaat. The Tabliri Jamaat, just to summarize some key facts, during the 1920s, the Deobandi scholar Mulana Muhammad Ilyas founded the missionary movement Tabliri Jamaat with its headquarter in New Delhi. Muhammad Ilyas motivated ordinary Muslims to engage as lay preachers, learning about Islam by delivering their understanding of basic values, learning through teaching, very similar like what academics do. Tabliri lay preachers travel in small groups of five to ten to nearby mosques in which they eat and sleep and preach basic knowledge about Islam. They deliver inspirational religious talks and then urge the audience to volunteer for missionary journeys. A basic missionary trip lasts three days. Other missionary journeys can last weeks, month or a whole year. When Tabliri missionary activities began to expand globally in the late 1960s, Muslims in Pakistan and India joined missionary journeys firstly in order to be able to visit foreign countries because it was a very hard time to travel. When Barilvi youth started joining Tabliri trips, few Barilvi scholars like Arshad Al-Khadri and the GOP sand politician Shah Ahmed Nurani strove to set up a rival Barilvi organization to support transnational missionary journeys for highly religious young men in the framework of neo barilviat Both missionary movements, the Tabliri Jamaat and the Dawat Islami, are global Dawa movements. They establish centers, mosques, and institutions for Islamic education to promote Sunnah as a way of life. I mean, both movements, we, we always call them Dava movements without reflecting on it, but both movements uh, do missionary work within the Muslim community. So being Muslim is obviously not enough. Their Islamic education programs revolve less around traditional Islamic disciplines of knowledge but center on character education. The moral or character education assemblies are usually staged in mosques during preaching tours or ijtimas, regular congregations, and stress the importance of community, universal brotherhood or sisterhood, mutual respect, manners, honesty, and other non-tradition specific values. The Barilvi tradition was forced by the Tabliris to redefine itself against new players on the market. They did so by cultivating specialized identities, serving a small market niche. The obvious paradox is that markets are not very good at tradition. Markets thrive for innovation on ephemeral fads and fashions. Markets constantly itch for new products. The tradition's logic as a community of memory and commitment must undermine or counterbalance rather than reinforce market logic. At the end of the 20th century, Barilvi leaders had to translate the sets of beliefs and practices serving as benchmark for Barilvi identity into contemporary language and a system of publicly shared codes and schemata that provide interpretive frameworks and rules that organize action and create an environment conducive to conversion. Davati Islami has by now become truly a transnational tablighe movement. By the end of 2007, Davati Islami has officially become the largest religious organization inside Pakistan. Davat Islami is active in over 70 countries worldwide. In 2008, 
the movement launched its own television channel, Madani Channel, which is aired to more than a hundred countries. All centers run their own tertiary educational institutions and shops of its own chain, selling DVDs, VCDs, <coughs> Islamic software like searchable traditional fatwa collections, devotional paraphernalia and of course literature still. <laughs> Each of the centers operates as an individual business. The aggressively advertised non-profit policy makes sure that the money generated is being used for nothing else but the expansion of the center. Most centers operate their own Darul Ifta, an office for legal advice which can be contacted in person via email or instant chat or by phone. In particular, these mufti hotlines became highly popular in Pakistan. I remember during my field work, when I was in the mosque, at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., in the middle of the night, asking all the stupid questions that came up in my mind, and that are very many, <laughs> uh, there would always be someone in the group who would uh, call the mufti hotline to, to back his argument. So I don't know when these muftis sleep, <laughs> but. Uh, these hotlines operate 24-7. Uh, a fatwa is only a, a phone call away. Furthermore, these centers organize weekly congregations and mosques managed by other institutions. While Dabat Islami copies the activities and organizational structures of the Tablighi Jamaat, the members differ from them in appearance mainly because of the green turban. The six points of action of the Tablighi Jamaat are worked out into 72 directives, the Medina rewards, which serve as guidelines to evaluate the daily performance. The Founders' Handbook of the Sunnas resembles the main book of the Tablighi Jamaat, Fazail e Amal, Virtuous Deeds, and is entitled Faisan e Sunnat, the spiritual benefits of the Sunnah. The Dawat Islami has an edge over the Tablighi Jamaat as it runs its own chain of madrasas with more than a thousand madrasas in Pakistan alone. The two movements operate similarly, employing peer pressure and rewarding conformity. The Sunnah mongers impose a strict dress code on their followers, which is the white shalwar kameez as we have seen in the movie yesterday and are organized in extremely mobile small units of lay preachers who invite for weekly and annual congregations. Highly religious young men travel on missionary journeys to mosques where they eat and sleep during their preaching tours and invite the local neighborhood to join them in prayer, after which they stage interactive dars and sikr sessions, reading a chapter of their respective Sunnah Catechism and collectively celebrate names of God. They then, then urge people to register for missionary journeys. The two movements stress piety of action as well as the strict and literal imitation of the life of the prophet in all aspects of the daily routine. As missionary, Dai, the lay preacher has to act like a perfect, ideal, a super Muslim, so to speak. Selling sunnas as salvation goods, the lay preachers are at the same time promoters and consumers of the commodities they promote. The commodity they are prompted to put on the market, promote and sell are themselves. The test they need to pass in order to be admitted to the social prices they covet demands them to recast themselves as commodities, as products capable of catching attention and attracting demand and customers. The lay preachers are marked with easy recognizable symbols and signs of belonging, which exemplify modern processes of transformation in systems of religious practice with the means of identity formation. This process I want to call Sunnization. The Islamic project, the virtual direct of change in society, 
of these new Islamic youth movements is the Sunnization, the reshaping and reconstruction of the daily routine and the individual markers of identity based on the examples of the Prophet as portrayed in the Hadith literature. This so-called non-political Sunnization can be understood as the privatization or individualization of political re-Islamization. It focuses on the private sphere instead of the political and argues with the Hadith rather than the Quran. Each of these movements produced its specific commentaries on selected Hadith. Sunnization is a process to encourage people to establish the Sunnahs of the Prophet, meaning that every individual establishes deep, unambiguous and public visible ties to the Prophet in his personal daily worlds of living. Remodeling your life with respect to the Prophet. The focus, however, is the stage managing of the lay preacher's imitation of the Prophet in the public sphere. Their symbols of piety, claiming capital of authenticity to fool the dynamics of conversion. Equipped with the symbols of the super-Muslim, all the paraphernalia to win over the hearts of the people, the lay preacher serves as a role model for the ordinary Muslim. Neatly dressed up followers and a demonstrative culture of cleanliness and discipline are central elements of free essentialized religious symbol systems. Besides clothing style and behavior, speech is another main area to express and experience sonization. As an activity or an apt performance, sunna becomes the norm to const constitute a moral self. Expressing the right niya intention is the signifier to mark that a daily action is performed as a ritual of worship. To express this ritual commitment, missionaries make use of an Islamic phraseology of the daily routine that is sacralizing everyday life. On condition of multilingualism, this dynamic dialectics between religion and culture results in the increased use of phrases like Bismillah, Inshallah, MashaAllah, Astaghfirullah, Allahu Alam, many more, we all know them, in virtually any act of communication. As new agents of hard religion, the lay preachers of Dawat -e Islami compete with Tabliris in an aggressive rat race for supplying salvation services as the lay preachers also compete with modern and secular recreational activities. The modernization of religious rituals include active marketing measures like the staging of religious mass events with regional TV and sports stars. In Pakistan, it's usually cricket players of the national team who visit uh, the annual Ijtima, the big mass events. And as you can imagine, mullahs and Cricket players are different social spheres, in fact, as different as it can get within Pakistan. And yet both of them benefit from their interaction. The lay preacher supports the in by capitalism transformed modern society's visible trend towards consumer autonomy and individualization of religious participation and created programs for expressive individualism and religious event culture, religion as an experience factory. The imitatio muhammadi is not just a means to generate savab, but also social capital, like trust and authenticity capital. The Islamic dress code serves in the here and now as a freedom ticket with which young Muslims can autonomously generate social capital, which allows them to reshape the Islamic religious field in their in immediate environment. One could also analyze the missionary movements in the context of health and wealth religions, which propagate a healthy lifestyle and integrate their followers in permanent expanding trader networks, thereby creating long-term social structural processes of middle-class formation. 
central elements of this new religiosity and its increasingly engagement of the audience is the increasingly engagement of the audience in interactive tasks, new voluntarism, for example, pressuring people to join missionary tours, and a new focus on seeker spirituality, emphasizing expressive individualism and emotional experience over doctrine and ritual. Religious restructuring also seems to be characterized by a new and specific fluidity, allowing different communities to borrow from others' traditions. The direction of religious change is from confessionalism towards pietism. Revivalists stress individual conversion and the increasing effort of individuals to lead lives of moral purity. The privileged distinction is not drawn between by the acceptance of Islam, but the sticking to the sunnah of the prophet. The new moral communities seem to be more personal, privatized, downplaying doctrine and dogma, more therapeutic than theological. The frontier tradition of reform and revivalism puts a greater emphasis rather on prayer and preaching than on kalima and shahada meaning a greater emphasis on individual's emotional experience. Another central aspect of the new religiosity is the new relationship among tradition, community and authority. The market condition creates an environment in which lay preachers without any formal Islamic education act as religious entrepreneurs using moral language to sell Sunnah salvation items in a consumer-friendly way. The participation of lay preachers in these new and in large part self-organized tradition systems, which are in constant state of change, as change is a built-in future of tradition, transforms those into lived, into experienced traditions. The processes of strategies of change follow larger religious trends, which are in parts comparable to the transformation processes we see implemented through Pentecostals in the rest of the global south, if we think of South Africa and South America. The toolkit of religious change that translates and reframes religious language seems to be similar. Regarding the phenomenology of religion, it seems that we have parallel processes of change here and there, stressing personal transformation transformation through developing a personal relationship with one's prophet, the increasing imperative to share one's faith with the so-called confessing unbelievers in an expressive, soulful and pragmatic mode of religion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Will you stay there? Thomas, will you stay there? That's it? Yeah, okay. So. Thank you very much for your interesting and informative paper. Uh, you have drawn a very diverse and manifold picture of what it means to practice inner reform and renewal and personal piety in everyday life. And I very much liked how you linked these forms of religious practice that you called imitatio muhammadi with the big threats that wave modernity, uh, as for instance the individualization of religion the diversification of Islamic identities, uh, the mobility of religious actors in translocal or global spaces, or the emergence of a religious market and the transformation of believers into consumers. And you also tried to link your topic to the media dimension and to the dimension of translocality and translocality, translocality and transregionality. So my following my following commentary is a mix of questions that, on the one hand, reflecting my own interest, personal interest in your topic, um, that mostly from a perspective as a social anthropologist who I am, but at the other hand, um, I want to raise a couple of more rhetoric questions that could help maybe to, to stimulate or to inspiring a more general discussion on the concept of youth and how we can link youth and Islam. So, in your paper, Thomas, you identified young men as core religious actors and you presented um, these um, reform movements, Tablighi Jamiat and Dawati Islami, 
as attractive for overwhelmi overwhelmingly young Muslims. And I would like to get more information on the youth dimension of these movements you described here, as well as the phenomena of these super Muslims. So <coughs> and um, maybe we can link your paper also with the others that have been presented today. And uh, to put my question in the wider context uh, of the relation between youth and, and Islam, I would like to know how much use is in the phenomena you described and um, are there at least particular moments that can be identified as use or useful and um, does it make sense generally to discuss these movements in reference to use as an academic category and to change the approach what can we learn from these movements about Muslim youth in South and Southeast Asia. <coughs> So, my second remark refers to Islam as lifestyle and um, in your paper you draw on young people as religious consumers that are able to choose between a wide range of Islamic identities and images and I would like to add to this lifestyle consumption connection the concept of life chances and life chances are Lebenschancen in the Weberian way um, covers the opportunities the individual has to improve his or her quality of life. And in this context, religion can be a resource for social or even um, economic mobility, as well as a resource for coping with the many uncertainties uh, caused by everyday experience of modernity. And this seems to me a very important aspect if we discuss um, Islam and youth in combination. And you also referred in your paper to this aspect when, when you argued that the religious networks of reform movements like the Dawati Islami or Tablighi Jamiat are the core for social and career advancement. So, and to come back to the concept of life chances, is religion for the people you described here the only one opportunity to improve their social or economic careers? Or is religion for them an alternative among a couple of other opportunities? <coughs> so, and my very last point refers more to the general question of how to study Islam and Muslims. And um, I would like to, um, to refer to a vivid debat debate that I know from social anthropology and that came up with the many studies on new forms of Muslim piety and inner reform or personal religious renewal, just to mention Zaba Mahmoud or Charles Hirschkind. And uh, my colleague Samuli Schirke uh, very justifies, reminds us that if we deal, for example, with lay, pre with lay preachers or with pious religious people or Muslim activists, we deal with very religious Muslims in very religious situations. And uh, in, o in order to draw a more holistic picture of Muslim piety or religious renewal, uh, I think we should include also the ambiguities and contradictions that mark the everyday life of all human beings, whether they are very religious, very pious or more or less. And I think that this last remark is a very good link, which is maybe to the keynote speech we had yesterday from Mina, sorry, Mina Sharifi Fang. And we also had some comments or sa some links to these contradictions and ambiguities of life uh, when we talked on this jumping between different movements or also uh, when uh, Shanaz raised the question of um, self-reflecting -reflec uh, herself as is she a um, Muslim woman or not. So I think this is also a very important uh, point and Okay, thank you very much for your attention and now the floor is open for discussion. How would you like to respond? <laughs> Should I? I think it makes sense. Too. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, you raised uh, plenty of very interesting questions. Thank you very much for that. Um, Speaking about the youth aspect, um, both religions would not consider themselves as youth religions, and yet they are, <laughs> because 
the full-time members, those people who live 24-7 in the mosques, who are on a 12-month missionary journey, living in the mosque for a year and then prolonged for another year, these are young Muslim men. Once they get married, they move out of the mosque and they have to worry about money and a job. And <laughs> so these people, when I do field work in Pakistan and India and I stay at the mosque, uh, I'm mostly in touch with the, the full-time members. And these are mostly youngsters in the age from 14 to, let's say, 25. And actually it is important to connect this youth aspect to the aspect of individualization because, as you said, it's a very communal or communalistic uh, identity that is formed. It's not uh, individual in the sense of European individualization theory. But th these youngsters that, that live in the mosques in, these, uh, in Pakistan, they are mostly from a middle-class background. And their parents belong to a generation that have experienced Sia ul Haq, <laughs> that remember that Pakistan was once a nice country <laughs> and things went worse as more influence the mullahs got. And most of these middle class parents, they are more secular and more liberal than the state is portraying itself. So when these people who hate mullahs because they ruined Pakistan, see that their own boys and sons start wearing a beard and uh, wearing a turban and doing sikhra la ilaha illallah all day long. <laughs> they get crazy and they try to stop their children and, you know, come on, <laughs> be a normal. Uh, and then it comes to the point where these youngsters break with their family, where they see I am individually responsible for my salvation or damnation. I have to distance myself from my parents and my social milieu. And that is where they move to the mosque. Mm -hmm. And breaking with the parents is totally un-Islamic and non-Pakistani. And in that sense, I use the term of individualization. And there's the connection to the youth religion. And the aspect that any, in these lay preacher movements, any uh, formerly uneducated person can generate social capital and act like an Islamic authority is the most attractive for youngsters because the Islamic religious field is dominated by male elders and uh, the youngsters are the group that benefits the most from these new authority structures. And the same holds true for the concepts of life changes or um, another uh, formulation that I'm used, I used elsewhere is maximizing opportunity structures. Um, and that is the situation of Pakistan. There is not much money to generate within Pakistan. The only way to make money in Pakistan is with import-export and to connect to some transnational uh, trader network, import-export network and then I don't know, buy cheap medical pills in China and ship them via Karachi to Dubai and then from Dubai to North Africa or whatever. What's that? Yeah, thank you very much for your interesting lecture. I have a question regarding the gender construction within these groups and I have in mind a conversation with Farish Noor who accompanied a group of Tablighi in uh, Indonesia I think and uh, um, he said uh, for a month I didn't see a woman and uh, then uh, I started asking him how the relationships between the men are and he said it's a totally homosocial field and the relationships are very tender, very close and uh, what he mentioned was that uh, within the group um, so to speak traditional gender roles are 
are over overcome, that uh, they create new kinds of gender relationships which are not so um, evident in, in, in the world outside of the group. So my question was, uh, um, um, does that meet with your experiences? Is, is there uh, a new uh, idea of gender, of masculinity coming up in these groups? If so, um, how, how long do these uh, conceptions of gender last? Uh, all these boys uh, finally end up in a marriage, and uh, what what happens then? So the whole question of new masculinity is uh, is, is my concern. Well, yes, they all are married. There's, in the especially in particular in these transnational religious organizations, there's a, a own marriage market. There's a whole department connecting people from inside Pakistan with the proposal from outside Pakistan. So uh, yeah. <laughs> it's fascinating, but the marriage market functions, and I had several offers. <laughs> 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 it works. Well, uh, to the gender role, uh, Muhammad is not the main uh, role model for the sisters. The sisters uh, orient themselves more on Fatima. And what is new, uh, the gender roles are more, what's the right word, fundamental? So like what Dawat Islami introduced again in, in the southern parts of Punjab and Sindh is the wearing of the burqa, for example. And they have uh, their own Madani burqa made of extra thick black cloth. And that is something that is actually not typically the tradition of Pakistan in that areas. Um, but this uh, question gets interesting when we look outside of Pakistan in Europe, for example, uh, because the, the main... <laughs> Sorry? Well, men and women are totally separated. So if you travel on a missionary journey, there's no chance uh, you, you see a, a woman. I mean, shouldn't be, <laughs> should be impossible if everything works <laughs> out. And that is holds even true if you visit someone at home, if you visit some family, it should technically be impossible to see the wife of the person you're talking to. I once made a mistake. I was interviewing an Amir and we went to his house and his wife was hiding behind the door and I didn't know that. I entered and closed the door behind me and then this woman started screaming as loud as she could. <laughs> so I closed the door again and although she was wearing a burqa, I mean, it was not. Uh, but uh, another interesting story I wanted to tell is that the main future of these movements, the Tabliri Jamaat and the Dawat Islami, is to go on preaching tours. That is the main idea why these uh, things work. And to go on a preaching tour, to travel, is technically impossible impo just for men. Women are not allowed to travel without separate from their families, without, you know, a male. Uh, and there we do have in Europe now female preaching preaching uh, groups who go on female uh, missionary trips. Uh, that is something that is not advertised because technically by Sharia it's not possible, but it does happen in European countries now. Um, you mentioned and um, you explain it in your book in more detail <coughs> that the um, approach to new communication techniques and media is very elaborated and I would be interested to know um, or were you able to find out um, during your field work where does this um, really elaborated professional expertise come from um, with regard to distribution of media, um, what kinds of media should be introduced now, what kinds of products, how you distribute them, how do you know what to translate into which European language, etc. Um, 
so the professional background <coughs> and the expertise where it comes from and the second <coughs> short sorry short question um when you say that um when they move out of the mosque and get married and they have other things to worry about how does this change their relationship with the davate islamia how uh, their engagement or involvement okay thank you thank you for your very interesting talk and i have a couple of questions um first i would like to know why you talk about conversion to a movement uh, i would use the term um, joining the movement um, so i would like to know about um, why you use conversion second um, what came up already a little bit um, how were you perceived as a researcher um, and um, were you expected to join activities? Did you join activities and how, how was it for you? And um, my third question, uh, when you talk about Sunna Ising, um, uh, where, where do you base the origin um, of, of Sunna Ising? Um, um, because I think it's not, it's not um, a new phenomenon. Um, like Islam as lifestyle, um, it's already like Islam as a way of life is already in the word of the Deen. So um, yeah, that's my question. Thank you. All right. uh, to answer your question, I will start with the second question first because it's much e easier. When people move out from full-time members to half-time or weekend or Thursday evening members, uh, they also, their status is changing. They don't benefit from the funding systems, but they have to contribute to them now. So they are um, not m being paid anymore. The full-time members are being paid. Their expenses are being paid by the movement. Once they move out and have their family and their work, they pay for the others. That is probably the most important uh, change in institutional sense of term. If it comes to media, um, it's also more often a money question. It's, it's a, the movement is, is too big. That is the main problem. How to manage such a big movement with lay preacher? You have a lay preacher in this country claiming one thing and then a lay preacher in another country claiming another thing and nobody knows what is, what is right now. So that's why they were forced to set up a massive homepage with uh, putting all the letters and Farain, you know, edicts and of the Amir and everything online, all the books online with the latest edition so that everybody can check what is the current uh, uh, stand of the debate and um, that makes the distribution of books much cheaper because they don't have to print everything anymore they just uh, make new books available as download first and then they see how is the demand does it make sense to you know pay for all the printing first and then try to sell it and um, yeah, if it comes to these instant chats that ask a mufti uh, things, or you can also convert or make your uh, baya, baya uh, online via email. And that is the, the question of conversion. Um, well, we have to say that these different movements that we speak about, these different, different traditions or school of thoughts are enemies. <laughs> they declare themselves as kufr. No, they, <laughs> they don't accept. Uh, and when people switch their confessional identity from Deobandia to Barilviat, maybe the word conversion is not the right word because it's all within the boat of Islam, but uh, it's something very similar. I don't know a better word for switching the confessional identity. Did I join activities? Yes, and that's easily possible because it's Dawa movements, uh, all these preaching tours or whatever you can think of, is open for Muslims and non-Muslims alike. So there's no, it, it was never difficult with the movement itself 
to um, to operate. It is, however, Pakistan. We had the, the question perceived as a spy. Pakistan is a very difficult area to do research, in particular in mosques. And yeah, I have been kidnapped by the ISI once, 2006, and they thought I would have been a spy for India because I studied Indian languages and culture. <laughs> so uh, not only America is, is <laughs> a bad idea. Uh, Sunnahizing, indeed, the phenomena I was talking about is not new at all. We have it, well, probably since we have Islam, we have processes of Sunnahization. But usually in the literature, the term Islamization is used, and that for sure is the wrong term for the phenomenon we, we speak about. I mean, the question of Islam is never on, on discussion. The question, which, what is the right Sunnah of the, the Prophet? So we have two comments, Rachel and then Zinia. Yeah, just a quick question about um, the role of class. And uh, I think you mentioned that uh, m most of the people who are attracted to these uh, movements are, are, middle, are relatively middle class. And I just would like to hear more about what you think the source of, of their appeal to, to the middle class in particular is. You talked a little bit in the beginning about what, what was sort of the content of the preaching uh, of these organizations, but you didn't really distinguish between what the Deobandi, uh, what the Tablighi Jamaat people were saying and what the um, Barelvis were saying. Is there a big difference in their message? And if there is, what is the nature of uh, the difference? If they're competing, they're presumably, I'm assuming this, well, obviously, their their <laughs> approach is different uh, in the Deobans and the Brailis, but what about these preaching groups? How do they differ in what they're trying to promote among the audience? Um, the appeal for the middle class, I think, it's um, because of the opportunity structures. You know, this institution they give you a funding for visiting the madrasa. If you move to the mosque, they pay, you know, for your mobile phone, for your food, for your rent. You don't have, it is maximizing opportunity structures, in particular, if you want to leave Pakistan, and many young people want to <laughs> somehow get out of that country in the long perspective. And it does not appeal to working class because working class simply doesn't have time. I mean, <laughs> working class in Pakistan means they have to work. When they get eight, nine years old, they, uh, there's no option to stop working anymore. Um, Content-wise, uh, that is the interesting phenomena that most of the content, I mean, the, these missionary journeys were the unique future of the Tabiri Jamaat, and they were declared haram by the Barilvis first. And then they saw declaring it haram does not make it less successful, and they copied it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there are processes of uh, ritual theft and, and borrowing from each other tradition. But at the bottom line, the Tabliris are more what we could call a Wahhabi movement and Dawat Islami more Sufi movement. So the love for the Prophet is the most central uh, content for the Dawat Islami and for the Tabliri Jamaat it would be to understand Kalima. But uh, in practice it's very much the same. <laughs> and they don't go to the shrines and uh, I mean the Barelis don't do anything in the shrines. Of course. Oh they do because you just mentioned the mosque. Ah, no, they also go to shrines and, and, speak to and talk there. And they take over the shrines. <laughs> because they always come in groups and they don't leave again. So once they are allowed in other institutions, they usually take them over. Oh. <laughs> So we have uh, three comments, and I would like to suggest to put them together because, uh, yeah, the time is over. Uh, 
since you're talking about maximizing chances when joining the movement, I wonder whether there is sort of a high dropout rate as soon as you get out of Pakistan? Because if not, then probably there is something more behind it. Otherwise, it sounds a bit like quite economic. Yeah, that's it. I have just two questions. Um, one is uh, regarding um, how do they respond to the critique that is given to them in that particular setting? I I understand that uh, the Barelwis have been mocked uh, about in, in media. Um, it, like there's, um, they call the green parrots of Muhammad, they also call teenage mutant ninja turtles because of their dressing. Um, so I'm, I'm just uh, curious if they actually respond to that kind of critique uh, which is given to them. Um, the other thing is um, in this um, idea of imitating um, the, the prophetic model, um, if you've spent time at seminaries and at madrasas and spent time with these young boys, uh, have you noticed any points where the imitation fails or where that reproduction kind of, you know, the are there? Because everyone, I understand, is striving to become something, but are there some interesting failures where that model is not reproduced just to see if, you know, that's an interesting way of looking at this production of, of the model, what you call the imitatio Muhammadi? I part of my question you answered before uh, in your response, uh, but I was interested that when you would approach, well, uh, well, you know, when you would approach, start doing your field work, was there any uh, conversation about your intention? Uh, because as I understand, most of the gatherings are open to people, but they, it's because they understand that they are there only uh, to have a conversation about about what the meeting is about. Uh, and so were they aware that this is going towards a research or what was the kind of conversation you had around those things? Thank you. Well, I went to a very, um, just to start with the last question, a very fortunate time and I was in touch with the German members of Dawat Islami first before I went to Pakistan. And when I was in Pakistan in the headquarters, I met the German member that I was in touch before. And he could uh, tell those people that yes, he is a PhD student and it's not a spy and it's normal in Germany to do PhDs on such issues. <laughs> If it comes to the high dropout rate, that is a very difficult question for me to answer because there are so many different groups. Um, I think the largest groups are people who become, where was that question? That, was here. <laughs> uh, that are people who start to be over motivated and then the movement decides that this person is not a uh, correct brother anymore. And he, uh, is that? he's not allowed to join those activities of the institution anymore because he's too, people sometimes become crazy when they are too long in touch with religion. <laughs> um, if it comes to Europe, uh, because you asked your question about Europe, um, the situation is much more complex because Davati Islami also helps people to apply for student visas, for example, or for irregular migration, if they go via Iran, Turkey, and then in a container to Greece. Uh, from Greece and with a container to Spain, for example. And uh, these people cannot drop out because they have to pay for the migration process. So they're naturally not very religious because they just are in touch with the transnational movement in order to migrate. Um, but they cannot get out of the institution <laughs> because they have to pay for the migration process. They get the money lent in Pakistan and in Europe they have to pay back. So they have their own houses and they get their jobs uh, through the institution. 
and they cannot leave before uh, they have worked their money off. And there is a mafia, a Pakistani mafia. So when I was in Barcelona, one of my contacts was shot because he lost his job and didn't want to, <laughs> he wanted to disconnect to the movement. And that is not possible. In, in that particular sense, if you came to Europe with the help of Dawat Islami and you have to pay back the money, there is, it's not a good idea to distance yourself from the institution. <laughs> the, the organization is also, for those who know Pakistan closer, connected to the Sunni Tariq. Um, the Sunni Tariq is the mafia organization in Karachi. Yeah, response to critique. Well, they do respond by their own actions. <laughs> As you know, there was Mumtak, Mumtaz Malik Kadri who shot the governor of Punjab, Salman Tasir, and that was one sort of response to... Uh, and also another reason why Dawat Islami is now um, getting in a confrontative situation with the military and the intelligence agencies inside Pakistan. Whether I've come across examples where the model process has failed, I cannot answer because I don't know what is true or not and I don't care. I'm just uh, writing what I see. I don't judge and I cannot. Yeah. Thank you very much. And yeah, coffee break again? A very short coffee break.